Well, thank you all for joining me uh, this Saturday morning. I've got my cup of coffee. I hope you're all relaxed and, and ready to look at some iNaturalist and really just enjoy the awe and beauty of Leela using iNaturalist. And then I'm also going to talk about um, some of the work that the UNT ecology majors and the Society for Ecological Restoration has done at Leela. So my name is Dr. Jamie Baxter Sly and I work at UNT. I'm an instructional lab supervisor. So I have a staff job. Um, I'm really lucky I get to design laboratory courses like the ecology laboratory uh, for majors and the environmental science laboratory for non-majors. And I've been super lucky to be able to work down at Leela with Richard and Dr. Ken Steigman and have learned a lot uh, just by walking around and hanging out with them. Uh, so I'm excited to do this presentation today because, you know, three of my favorite things in the world are, you know, also my family, but, uh, you know, Leela and iNaturalist and my students. And so I've kind of combined all, all of those into this PowerPoint. <clears throat> So we're gonna talk about the upcoming iNaturalist City Nature Challenge. And then I wanna look at some historical records at Leela using iNaturalist. Um, and then, like I said, go into what the students have been doing and then answer any questions that you might have over any of that. So we have this upcoming uh, City Nature Challenge. And so this is on the iNaturalist platform. And if you've never used that before, you can go to inaturalist.org and you log in and you create a username. And then how it works is when you take pictures of wild things in nature, you upload them to that platform and then a community of um, iNaturalist uh, users will help identify the species of plant or animal that you find. And iNAT's pretty cool. It has a uh, software component that takes a look at your, your observation and, and tries to help out um, with the identification in that way. So every year um, since 2016, um, there's been a city nature challenge. And when it first got started, it was just two cities uh, competing against each other. And then each year it grows and grows and grows to where more cities are participating. And so this year in Texas, we have all of these shaded regions that are participating in the City Nature Challenge. And this is happening April 30th to May 3rd. So on Friday, um, when, it, when it rolls, you know, Thursday rolls on into the evening and it hits midnight for Friday, April, you know, 30th, that's when this starts and it goes until May 3rd to 11.59 uh, p.m. So any observation that is captured on iNaturalist is automatically uh, entered into the City Nature Challenge if it falls in one of these regions. And so if you make an observation in say this lime green area, then that is going to go towards the Dallas-Fort Worth city in the city nature challenge. If you're down here in San Antonio and you make an observation, that will go towards the San Antonio. After May 3rd, we have an opportunity during May 4th and May 9th to identify what was found and then we'll have the final results. Uh, there are some new cities in Texas um, this year, the heart of Texas, I believe, is new for this year and there was one other one and I apologize that I don't remember exactly which one um, it is this year. So <laughs> if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the region that is um, participating in the City Nature Challenge this year is found here in this uh, um, orange section here. So all of, all of this area um, will be the DFW uh, region. So again, any observation between April 30th and May 3rd will be entered into this um, automatically. You don't need to do anything other than just observe and, and, and be in nature. The results, um, and you can see all of the observations if you go to the City Nature Challenge 2021 DFW 
uh, page. And they, it's kind of fun, um, you know, we're, do, we're in a pandemic. And so it's not really a, a competition this year. We're, we're just engaging and, and healing with the power of nature this year. Um, although I can tell you, it's hard for me to turn off my competitive spirit. And when you log on to that um, City Nature Challenge DFW, what you're gonna find is, um, you know, everybody that has made an observation it will rank us by the number of observations and the number of species. Uh, so it's, it's pretty fun uh, to, uh, to do. <clears throat> you can also go to the global one and see how you're doing uh, in the global rankings as well, if you have that competitive spirit like I do. <clears throat> so again, you know, this year we're in a pandemic, so we're, we're engaging with the healing power of nature. And if we take a look at last year, you know, last year was uh, right around the time when the COVID-19 pandemic um, was starting, we still had 41,000 people participate last year with over 800,000 observations made across the world. And there were 32,000 species that were found. And of those, 1,300 were rare, endangered, or threatened. And so it's, it's quite a special uh, event in that we get to look at what everybody else is finding around the world and engaging uh, on a global level. So I think it's important that we look towards Leela. What can we do at Leela? And it's my understanding that we don't have any um, formal events scheduled. In the past, before COVID, like in 2019, I know uh, that there was quite a few events um, during the challenge. But perhaps if you happen to be out at Leela during the, uh, the challenge this year, it would be awesome to show the world uh, the awe uh, and beauty of Leela once again. So last year, uh, these, this is how DFW did, we got second. Um, right behind Cape Town. And then we've got San Francisco coming in third. And I think it's really cool if you look at this leaderboard of cities from 2020, you've got DFW, Houston, Galveston, and Austin in the top of the cities that participated. And they're all in Texas. How wonderful is that? I think it's so wonderful that we, that Texas really gets together and shows the world, uh, the Texas natural history and biodiversity. So this is what I'm talking about, how the leaderboard looks, where it will come up with the most observations. Uh, here we've got Adam Cochran leading with Sam Biology coming in second, and then the most species here. And it also will show us the most observed species and it will put all the species in order from most observed to least observed. So it's really interesting. All right, so if you've never used um, iNaturalist before, uh, the, the main question usually is what makes a good observation? So what we're looking for is any living thing that is wild. We're not really interested in your cultivated rose bushes, um, you know, things that you have, have planted. We're, we're looking for things that are wild or naturally exist here in the DFW area or at Leela. And the type of picture is very important because what you're doing is, is you're showing INAT users what you are seeing and they will help you identify it to the lowest possible taxonomic level that they can using the photographs that you provide. So the better the pictures, um, the, the finer the resolution on that taxonomic ID, perhaps even to species that we can get to. So if you take close up shots, if you take pictures of the whole entire plant, uh, multiple angles of insects. And then the other thing is iNaturalist will ask you, what did you see? And sometimes you don't know, but you, can, you know if it's a plant, uh, you can type in plant and leave it just at plant A. Or if it's an animal, uh, you can type in animal and it will just leave it at animalia. Or if you find a mushroom, you can type in fungi and just leave it at fungi. And that's gonna put your observation in, in the right category. And then the, the people that do a lot of the identification work, um, they, they choose their category that they're good at identifying and that really helps. 
Um, so you don't have to be perfect at using iNaturalist when you first get started. The iNaturalist community is a super friendly community um, and, and they like to tell you and, and show you ways that you can do better on your photographs. So here's an um, example of a flower. You know, I never know if I'm taking um, the right pictures until I don't and then somebody instructs me on how to do it better. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that feedback. So this is an example of a tall poppy mallow. And for this particular flower, I needed all four of these pictures to be able to get it to the species level ID. And that's because the sepals are important, the stipules are important uh, diagnostic features of this species. Had I just taken a picture of this um, flower here on the top right, um, we may have just been left at poppy mallow, which is fine. <clears throat> Um, insects, don't be afraid to get close to the insects. Um, you may stay away if you're, you know, allergic uh, to bees or afraid, that's okay. But the closer that you can get, the better and multiple angles are always nice. Uh, we have this red banded hair streak over here um, on the left. And this is a neat uh, butterfly. It has this false head that's used to deter predators. In the middle, we have the fall webworm moth. This is how it looks as an adult. We're used to seeing them as caterpillars when they make their webs on the trees. And then over here on the right, we have the hackberry columnar stem gall midge. And this may have gone overlooked. So when you're making observations, look very closely at the leaves of the trees and you might find something interesting like this gall midge. Um, this is a dipterin, which is from the fly, the true flies. And that particular family, let's see if I can say it correctly, Sissidomyidae, I believe. Um, it's pretty neat. It, uh, sometimes that family has larvae that reproduce without maturing. And um, on the about section in iNaturalist, so when when you click on the about section for a particular species in iNaturalist, it pulls up the Wikipedia information for that particular species. And in that Wikipedia for that family, it says that there is a possible 1 million undescribed species. And if that is the case, it could make it the most species family in the entire animal kingdom. And these are very typical on our sugar hackberries um, around our area. So that's a fun way to increase your species list for the INAT challenge. If you're going to take some pictures of trees, make sure that you get the leaf of the tree. And we also need a picture of the bark is very helpful. And then make sure you get a picture of the whole entire tree showing the architecture, you know, the post oaks, they wave upwards and kind of craggle uh, where a bur oak, you know, is shaped a little differently. Um, you've got the American elm that is vase shaped. So that architecture of the entire tree is very useful along with the leaf. All right, so why do we like iNaturalist? Why is it relevant? Um, this is, this top picture right here is all of this red is our observations. So you can see across the entire globe, there are over, there are more than 54 million observations that have been made. Um, and look at how many identifiers and observers we have across the globe. So it truly is a global community. And of this global community, there are experts and academics and professionals and naturalists and citizen scientists and hobbyists um, that work together to identify and observe the biodiversity of, of Earth. Um, we also use this particularly at Leela. We can show people the biodiversity of Leela with pictures and maps. And I'm very lucky in that it's, it's my top hobby. Um, I engage with nature to heal myself. I need to get outside into nature almost every day if I can. Um, and I use this as my hobby. So when my family is playing video games, I have my own video game. It's called iNaturalist. It's like Pokemon Go for real life. So do we have an INAT project at Leela, something that we can use to talk about 
um, the biodiversity at Leela. And it turns out that we do, if we search iNaturalist for Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area, there are several projects that pop up. Uh, this is the top one that pops up um, and it was made by Bill Freiheit. Um, it's one of the um, projects that was like one of the first kind of projects that you could do on iNaturalist where you have to manually add observations. Um, there's some, some boundary issues with this one. And then I also found uh, this one was made more recently in 2019. I believe Michael Fox and Wild Carrot um, are the admins of this project. And this is one of the newer project types. Its boundaries look good um, to where it's capturing, automatically capturing any iNaturalist observation that's made in within the the map boundary of Leela. So, so far at Leela, we have 62,000 observations that have been made and you have 2,554 species as of Monday of this week. And I like iNaturalist because it gives you a nice breakdown of the taxa. Here you see in the green, we have our plants and then the orange becomes things um, like our animals, our spiders, our insects, mammals. Um, here we've got reptiles in blue and then hot pink is fungi. Um, so pretty neat uh, way to view. When you go to this uh, iNaturalist project, you can click on species and it will show you all of the species and it will rank them in the number of observations um, that those species have from the, the most observations of a species to the ones that aren't seen very often. The thing about iNaturalist that, that you need to keep in mind is it's, it's not really useful to infer an abundance of a particular species because, you know, if I like a particular flower, I am going to observe that flower over and over and over again. Um, so it's, it's kind of biased in that way. It's, it's, it's the observer's choice. So it's not really good about showing abundance, but it is good about showing richness and richness is the number of species in a given area. So you have some uh, Leela volunteers um, that are the Leela, the top 10 Leela observers. So these are the people that are walking around Leela carrying these great big heavy cameras and taking these amazing photographs of the wildlife. Maybe they don't even have the big cameras and just using their cell phones to take pictures. Um, but these are the top 10 observers at Leela. We have Denver Kramer and Jennifer Lind and Alchemist 2000 and Michael Fox and Wild Carrot and Aiden Campos and Brennan and so forth. Uh, so making some really nice observations and showing the world what Leela has to offer in terms of biodiversity. And you can click on those observations and see those magnificent photos that they're taking. The true superstars though, I mean, other than the observers are the identifiers because these are the people that get on iNaturalist and they help um, place the correct identification on those observations. Sam Biology is Sam Kieschnick. He is the DFW uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Urban Wildlife Biologist. And then we have Aguilita. He is something really, truly special. He is my colleague at the University of North Texas. He is a UNT history professor and he is a self-taught naturalist. Um, Aguilita is Dr. Roberto Calderon and uh, he, Aguilita is actually the top identifier in the world in iNaturalist and Leela, uh, excuse me, Sam I think is like uh, number, number three in the world or number four in the world. So it's, it's really quite something that here in DFW, we have two of the top iNaturalist users in the world in our area, very lucky. Catherine Wells uh, is from Flower Mound and she does a lot with the Flower Mound and other things. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate our top 10 Leela identifiers. Did you know that Leela is also home to 26 species that are listed on the IUCN a red list as either being threatened or endangered or vulnerable. And these are your 26 species that, that iNaturalist has captured anyway. Um, and it shows you the species and then the number of observations that are made at Leela. Um, 
this is pretty spectacular. There are many birds. We have some plants here like the ash trees that are vulnerable to the emerald ash borer and of course our American alligator and species like the American bumblebee. And don't forget your northern bobwhite quails. <clears throat> So where do the observations occur at Leela? So this is the map um, boundary of the iNaturalist Leela project. And you can see uh, there's loads of observations over here on the Blackjack Trail. Um, and then as you proceed down to the river, uh, lots of those. We've got some over here on the prairie restoration sites and then even um, south as you go down uh, Fish Trap Road. I'm not sure, and I'll have to ask uh, Richard and talk to Richard, about why there's not very many observations down here in this section. Uh, this is captivating my interest and I, I need to get down there. Where are the alligators? So you can use iNaturalist to search for different species. And so this map here is showing where our observations are of the, the American alligator. So again, it's not useful to show the abundance of alligators because we don't know if it's the same alligator getting their picture taken over and over again, like, oh, here comes the paparazzi. Um, but it definitely does show where the alligator has been in terms of where it has been sighted uh, for people to take a picture of it. How many plants do we have? So on iNaturalist, we have 665 species of plants that have been observed at Leela. Um, and this is direct, a direct result of uh, the Leela volunteers that do all of the hard work with the greenhouse and, and, and working very hard to, to plant all those plants and the, and the burnings and the seedings and just uh, a phenomenal effort of restoration going on um, at Leela. Which mammals occur at Leela? So we've got 22 mammals listed. I didn't include um, the dog. The domestic dog was another one that was on here. Um, so these are the, the native species that um, I pulled up from the, the database. So you can see those here. And I compared the iNaturalist database with the checklist that's found on leela.org. So, you know, iNaturalist isn't perfect. It's, it's based on who is observing and what are they finding and, and uploading. And so the species on the checklist, that is from, you know, documentations by I'm sure Dr. Ken Steigman and others about what they have seen. So there's 20 species on the iNaturalist versus 30 um, on the leela.org website. If we look at bird species, there are 293 on leela.org, and I, I believe a lot of that information is from Dr. Steigman and the Leela bird banders and others. And if, if we compare that by the Leela bird nerd iNatters, so the people like Denver Creamer and Jennifer Lind who walk around and take pictures of birds, we have a difference there in the bird species. So I had a couple of questions that I didn't get to really analyze. Are there birds on the iNaturalist database that are not on leela.org? And would it be possible for the bird banders to start putting their, their species that they're finding at the bird banding stations onto iNaturalist? And I know that they have started doing this. And I think one of the reasons is, is because uh, there are a lot of students that have learned how to use iNaturalist through some courses at UNT and they like to put their observations and so that that has increased a little bit. Uh, so I think I'll stop there. Richard, do we have anything in the chat, any questions in the chat that I that I should stop and answer? Not yet. It's mainly me answering your questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> well, then I'll continue. Feel free to, to chat away though and ask questions all you like. All right, so where, well, how else do we use Leela? So this is a, a project that's on iNaturalist that I made and back in, uh, I guess it was probably around September, Richard calls me up and he says, hey, uh, I'm ready to, uh, to, to do a burn on, on the area um, south side of uh, McWhorter Creek and I would like to do a pre-assessment. And so uh, Scott uh, went down there and set up some transects 
um, down in the, the area south of McWhorter Creek. And then myself and a UNT SIR uh, student, uh, Himena, and I went down and did an assessment. And so uh, after that is when we did the big burn of that area. But before the burn, we found 37 species um, and prior to that. So here's some pictures of that burn that occurred. We did 58 acres burned in November of 2020. And then after that, the area was seeded with prairie plants. Those 10 quadrants, uh, research quadrants are still in place. And so we plan to go back out in May and do a post assessment so we can compare pre-burn versus post-burn and seeding. And all of that information will be found within that iNaturalist project. <clears throat> there's another thing that happens at Leela. So there's a group of iNaturalists um, that call ourselves modelings. And we are a group of people that like to use black lights to discover uh, nocturnal species that, that are drawn to black lights. Um, and we hang up these white sheets with the black lights. And then you have all these just tons of insects coming to it at nighttime. So uh, I think it was September 18th, a group of mothlings gathered at the prairie with our cameras and we set up these black lights and <clears throat> that night we captured uh, 960 observations over on Barn Owl Ridge and of those observations there were 251 species so they weren't just moths they were all kinds of things like dragonflies and uh, my favorite one that we found was this yellow sunflower moth and the yellow sunflower moth, it um, as, a, as a caterpillar, wraps itself up into the sunflowers and pupates and then emerges as an adult. Super cool find and it's very indicative of a healthy prairie. Other things that we found look like this. Uh, tons of, of moths and dragonflies and coronamids and um, even the juniper stink bug, the says mantis fly. Um, there was a really neat prairie, um, praying mantis. So, you know, normally whenever I'm out and about making observations, if I see a praying mantis, it's usually um, a stagmo mantis or, or a Carolina mantid. Um, but at Leela, you guys have this slender prairie mantis, um, which is super cool and not, not found. I, I haven't really found it anywhere else other than, other than Leela. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna transition. Uh, Richard, are there any questions now? No. No. Okay. Good. Hey, Jamie. I do. I do want to tell you. I have to leave uh, in about fifteen minutes to run some kids somewhere. Okay. Um. All right. So I'm going to transition now and tell you a little bit about the University of North Texas Student Chapter of the Society for Ecological Res Restoration. So the Society for Ecological Restoration itself is a global um, organization and we have a Texas chapter and then at UNT we have the student chapter. And the student chapter has over 80 undergraduates from all different majors from geography to ecology. Um, we have some, um, I, I think some art majors now too. Uh, so I really like the diversity of students um, in this group and uh, just this, uh, Last week, we learned that the UNT SIR chapter was awarded the best student organization at UNT uh, as an Eagle Award. So we are really quite proud of that endeavor. Uh, they did a lot of great things uh, despite, you know, they weren't able to meet um, this entire past year due to COVID. So they did a lot of virtual things. One of the things they did was um, they affiliated the SIR chapter with the National Audubon Society uh, campus program. And now we have students being liaisons that serve Audubon and give information to SIR students. So they've done tons of things. Uh, so I wanted to share a little bit of what they've done at Leela. So first thing is we've got these nest box cameras. So we had a student, Jordan Curtis, that, that did a lot of these videos where there's, there's cameras mounted in your nest boxes out there. This one in particular is right there by the office. And what we're about to see is, I believe, an Eastern screech owl. Got a juicy uh, hawkworm caterpillar, I believe, and some eggs.
<laughs> oh, what a beauty. And then here are the babies. So I use these videos um, when we capture them feeding on something. I use these videos to teach students about the trophic transfer of energy. So what they are eating and how much energy that they are getting from uh, their prey item. So we use this both in the environmental science labs and also the ecology laboratories. Um, this is a, a box that had a, a wood duck female that laid um, a bunch of eggs and then had this visitor, the western rat snake, that decided that the eggs would be a, a tasty meal. Um, so one, uh, one thing we could do for this box is make it uh, snake proof. <laughs> and you can, you can do that with nest boxes by making sure that they're not attached um, to things that snakes can crawl up at crawl up on and get into. And then the, this video here, um, I was hoping to get some kestrel footage at Leela and was not able to. So this is showing an American kestrel actually at the UNT pollinative prairie that's located on the Denton campus. But here we've got this kestrel. She comes every, or she stays at the prairie every year and then has a clutch of babies. Babies are tagged um, by the UNT Raptor Research that is led by Dr. Jim Bednars. And then Kelsey Biles is the PhD student that works with the Kestrels, both at the Pollinator Prairie and at Leela. The other thing that we do at Leela is we collect owl pellets. So in the past, it's been Dr. Steigman that has collected these pellets. And then I, I believe that um, here lately, uh, some of the, the Friends of Leela volunteers have been collecting pellets. And so the owls that you have at Leela, um, they have, um, they, they regurgitate these pellets and the pellets contain things like bones um, from their prey items. So anything that can't, um, that's too big, that, that can't pass through the gizzard is then regurgitated up. Now this is very interesting because we can um, sterilize these owl pellets and then we give them to the upper level mammalogy lab the mammalogy lab students then dissect out the pellets and then determine what the prey item is based on the skulls and the bones found, um, mainly, uh, of course, rodents and, and, and shrews. Um, this information, um, and let's see, when was that 2017, I believe, we had um, the best undergraduate student poster was Matt Jones, who presented some of this owl pellet information. And then Dr. Jimenez and some, uh, some students, Matt Jones, Caitlin Stoddard, Sintel, Abigail, and then myself and Dr. Stagman were able to write a paper on the, there's a long-eared owl um, that we collected pellets from, and we're able to determine the, the prey difference between the long-eared owl and the barn owl at Leela. So I take the ecology lab, which is a sophomore level class. There are 50 um, uh, ecology majors in that laboratory. I take them to Leela four times every semester. I wasn't able to take them this last year due to COVID, um, but we hope to, to return coming to Leela this next year, I hope. Um, but we, we do four different field trips. This one is the prairie assessment where the students go and do a uh, percent coverage assessment of the prairie. Um, this location was over by the platform. We also do a birding trip. It's like a modified Christmas bird count, uh, if you will. And this and this particular pictures, we did that on the Bittern Marsh Trail. Students love the Bittern Marsh Trail. Uh, we also do an aquatic assessment of the Elm Fork. So we go right down where the outfall is of the dam and we collect benthic macroinvertebrates and we do an entire uh, TCEQ habitat assessment of the Trinity River. <clears throat> and uh, have a lot of fun out there. And we also do a tree assessment. Uh, it's called a point quarter assessment of the Blackjack Trail uh, where we go out and we measure diameter breast height um, on some quadrants on the Blackjack Trail. 
uh, and determine uh, circumference and diameter of those of certain trees. The other things that we do at Leela um, in terms of UNT and the, in the undergraduate students, the SIRS students, or many of them are involved with Dr. Bednar, Bednar's and Ivy Doak at the Leela bird banding station, and then also the UNT raptor research um, that Dr. Bednar's is a part of. So, um, you know, when they come in as undergraduates, they go through their freshman year, they get into my sophomore level ecology lab and Dr. Bednar's and Dr. Hoenghaus's sophomore level classes and they learn about opportunities at Leela. They meet Richard who comes to talk to classes, um, invites them to come and volunteer at Leela and then they start becoming involved. And if they do um, 75 hours of volunteer work at Leela, the UNT Division of Student Affairs, uh, We Mean Green Fund offers an environmental volunteerism cord and there is a specific Leela tract. So if they gain 75 hours, they get this really cool cord for graduation. This cord is very unique. Um, it is handmade by other UNT um, students and the dye that is used is actually grown in the UNT dye garden. So it's an interdisciplinary effort to offer these special uh, cords at graduation. And then Richard um, has hopes to provide, be able to provide an internship to students who have reached this uh, level of the 75 hours. So I just wanna end um, my talk with one of my favorite observations at Leela. Um, it's really special and I get a little teary eyed because when I go out to the prairie and I see all of the restoration work, I run across species that I can't find anywhere else. And one of those is the willow leaf sunflower. And Richard was like, hey, you wanna see this willow leaf sunflower? And I was like, oh yes. So I went over and took some pictures of it. And if I look up the willow leaf sunflower in Denton, you can see here in that picture that Leela is indeed the only place that it's been identified. Many times um, I will you know, observe a, a beetle you know, at my house, and it, it may be something that's not um, on iNaturalist a lot, but as a general rule, if I find it, it's at Leela. It's been at Leela at some point. And so Leela truly is an island in a sea of urbanization. And I'm, I'm truly thankful to be able to um, interact with Dr. Stegman and, and Richard. I've learned a great deal by coming there. Um, and I'm very thankful for the Friends of Leela and all of the volunteers in the city of Louisville. So many thanks to everybody and also thank you to Sam Kishnick and all of my INAT community friends. And I will end this and talk to you about anything that you wanna talk about. Thank you, Jamie. There was one question of, from Ruth Ann, who happens to be Alchemist 2000. She was wondering what, she was wondering what your uh, handle is. Baxter Sly, just my last <laughs> name. Now, can everybody else unmute themselves? Thank you. You barely hear you, Ruth Ann. Well, Jamie, thank you very much. I have to run. I've got kids who have to go to a choir practice. <laughs> okay, well, have a fantastic weekend, Richard. Thank you uh, for the opportunity for letting me um, do this talk. It really meant a lot to me. Well, I'm glad. And thanks everybody for joining us this morning. I hope y'all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Does anybody plan on being out at Leela um, during the challenge? I was going to reach out to uh, Denver Kramer and ask if he was gonna be out there. Back in the fall, we had a DFW um, only challenge. And I think Denver did over a thousand observations during that one. Oh, good. You guys will be out there and that's awesome. I have a plan of attack and I'm gonna start at midnight at my house with a black light 
And uh, then uh, I'm going to go over to the Barn Owl Ridge, I think, all day on, on Friday and end up doing some mothing out there on Friday evening. Uh, might go back out um, during the challenge. I don't want to give away my strategy too much because it, apparently Houston is trash talking us. I mean, they think that they're going to outcompete us this year. It's hard to turn that competition off, um, but we're, we're going to do it a COVID safe. I'll go ahead and stop the, the recording.